Hey man, I want to thank each and every one of you guys for coming so much. I know we're kind of in the off season for fishing. There's not really a whole lot of tournaments going on. I think we got some guys that are fishing a club tournament type deal, right? But I mean, as far as like all the major tournaments, that's all done. This is typically, as you can tell by the boat ramps right now, the slowest time of year between now and kind of mid to late January. There's really kind of almost a ghost town out here on Lake Fork. And to be honest with you, it's one of my favorite times because of that very reason. You can come here to Lake Fork, kind of have it to yourself which is a rare thing. Yes, sometimes the fishing can be tough, especially numbers wise, but she does kick out some good sized fish this time of year. Uh, every single year she kicks out biggins right now for those that'll get out there and get after them. And when you do find them, you catch all of them because ain't nobody else leaning on them the rest of the day. They're all years. So it's a fun time to be out here at Lake Fork. I know that uh, myself as, as well as many of the other guys, this is the one time of year people are always trying to Seems like I get a lot of last minute phone calls. Hey, you got anything open in the next two weeks? Hey, do you got anything open next month? Whatever. And, and fortunate, very fortunate to be this way, but usually the answer is no. Usually, like, if you want March and April trips, you better, you should have already booked them at this point. It kind of is the deal. But uh, right now, for December and January, myself or, or any of the other outstanding guides that we have here on Lake Fork, if you're wanting to get out and go trophy hunting or learn how to maybe try to grind out some good bites in the wintertime and, and maybe try to target some of these bigger fish that do bite this time of year, you can sure give us a call or a message or whatever at yourlakefortguide.com or just let us know. We can help get you lined up with anybody you want to or we can take you out ourselves. Got a first time guest and I'm, I'm really proud to have him here. I'm really proud to have him here. He is one of my favorite, favorite young men in the sport. He's a young fella. How old are you, John? I am actually 21. 21. I didn't know he was even that young. I thought he was a couple years older than that. <laughs> He's yeah. a young, young fella. But I'm going to tell you, I've watched this guy the last couple of years. Uh, just Jonathan Bowling from Broken Bow Lake in Oklahoma. And I've watched him the last couple of years, and, and I've seen what he does. And he's a full-time fishing guy, just like I am. And uh, he reminds me a lot of somebody we had around here named Eric Wright about five years ago. Anybody remember when Eric Wright started guiding when he was 19? People were like, 19? You don't need to be guiding at 19. But... There's exceptions to every rule in fishing, and Eric is one of them. Eric was an outstanding guy from day one. The boy can fish. He knows how to fish, and he's just a good person that's going to work hard for you. And John reminds me so much of Eric. I mean, he catches. I didn't know Broken Bow had the kind of fish in it that this, this guy produces. And he even fished against all the grown-ups in the BFL. Mm -hmm. and right. He won the BFL on Broken Bow this year against all these pro anglers. All these jersey-wearing suckers got whipped <laughs> by the kid. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> He's got, obviously, an extreme knowledge level for a man of his age and experience level, uh, and I'm super proud to have him here. I'm super proud to call him a very good friend of mine, and uh, just couldn't be thrilled to have a guy like this here. So, John, uh, you better live up to all that hype. I'm going to try to. What you going to talk to us about tonight, bud? I'm going to talk to you all about this bait right here. If you all don't know this bait, then y'all probably just need to literally walk out that door. <laughs> this bait has caught more fish in a lake than any bait. The last two years off this bait, I've probably won $16,000 off of this bait. And tonight, this is going to be how to fish these jigs that are big when it's like super cold outside. So, with that being said, these are going to be fished on wood. Like I'm talking, when I say on wood, Find the wood and stuff that's this deep when it's cold. Hmm. Those bass that are big, they don't always live out deep. Most of the time, it gets tough. If it's cold water, it gets tough. You're not going to catch 30 fish a day. Go for the five biggest fish that you can ever catch. They're, they all live, when it's cold, that deep of water. Last year, it was... Well, let me add something to this. This is, I, I had no idea this is where he was going, first of all. This is, I'm, I'm going to be like, my ears are perked up. Just like, <laughs> huh? yeah. 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 yeah, my ears are perked up just like y'all's are right now. And I want to throw in there, he's it's fishing, rock primarily rock. fishing Broken Bow Lake. This is a clear water, yep. deep, deep water impoundment. And this is the last thing I would have heard somebody from a clear, deep impoundment to be telling me so please continue so i just wanted all you guys off. yeah i just wanted all you guys to have the perspective <laughs> that water gets real cold in that lake salt so. the main thing is is if you're on the ramp the water's gonna say 55 or so if you go out deep that water's colder why would you fish out deep go out there at noon fish water that's this deep last year it was about 
outside is probably 38 degrees. We caught two. I think one went seven, one went right at nine. In the same day, fishing water this deep. Now, that day we maybe caught five, six fish, but they was all big. The thing with it is you want to fish a jig that is like super heavy because they do not want to eat. But you can always make one bite. You want that jig to fall fast, and I'm not talking about toss it out there and do this with it. Fish it like it's hot outside. Throw it right by that stump, like I'm talking make the jig hit the stump. Fall straight down. Rip that jig up. If he doesn't bite it when it first falls, they always do up. Rip it. If you don't get bit, there's not one right there at that stump. Cover as many stumps as you can all day long. It's like super easy. And this is the other thing. We've all been told when it's cold outside, this skirt's gotta be shorter, everything's gotta be shorter. Make this bait as big as you can. Yeah, but if you're stroking a jig like that and creating a reaction bite, that's yeah. a totally different deal than what we yeah. normally do in the winter. Totally time, different. So, yeah. But the thing with it though is you, the thing with it is you are gonna look weird. Because they're going to see you running. That's no problem for me. They're going to see you looking weird because you're going to run all the way back in the creeks, fishing around stumps, and there's going to be this one guy fishing way out here. He's going to be like, what the crap is he doing up there? But you're going to catch the biggest fish of your life. He's fixing to beat you at the weigh-ins. Yeah. He's doing. <laughs> yeah. Thing with it, though, is you have to rip it. I'm talking get your line tight and rip that jig up. Because there's always one right there at that stump. We fished... Last year in a cove, we literally counted stumps. There was 30 stumps in this cove. 26 of those stumps, we got bit. There was a guy fishing water 30 foot deep. He caught one fish. My best five that day went probably 30 pounds. And he caught one that was that big. So if I can throw something in here, to me, this okay. kind of, this is such a, I'm so glad you're here now. I'm even more <laughs> glad I was being because this is, I love, listen, the thing about me is no matter how much I do, no matter how many days I fish, I never get tired what I've loved about it from day one, I think it's what most of us fall in love with in bass fishing, is the process of tricking these fish. And different ways to do it always kind of keep you fresh and keep your mind young that way. And so what I'm hearing right here is basically, it's not that there's not fish out deep, uh, but what I'm hearing is these fish that are shallow allow you to present a bait to them in a way that forces them to react. Exactly. They exactly. either tuck tail and run or they open their mouth and attack it. Yep. And big dominant fish that are apex predators, make yep. no mistake about it. They ain't scared of nothing. Uh, they'll stare your boat down when they get on a bed if they're in the right mood. They're not scared. Yep. Um, they are more likely to be the ones that are going to open their mouth and not run from anything. Yep. So when you throw a little crawfish bluegill looking thing in there and go to jerking around his head, it's going to irritate him. Yeah, it's a lot like, you know, it reminds me a lot of, there's a, there's a deal that goes down called a January buzzbait bite that people always go, no. Really? Yes. It works. Really, it works. When there's big fish in water this deep, and you put something that annoying on their head, they got they, they're dominant creatures. They bite it out of, you know, they're just the apex predator. They want that out of their territory. Yep. This seems like kind of a similar deal where you're basically yep. going in there, irritate the fire out of them, making all this commotion, and they just bite it out of kind yep. of anger. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, the way that I've Is always it a thought, violent bite. Oh, it's 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 rough. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> it's it's rough. Oh, the thing about it. This is how that I've always thought. That's all I'm gonna do the rest of the winter. <laughs> this is literally how that I have. The thing with me is there's fish that live shallow all year long, That's and true. there is fish that are always deep. I've always preset. you there's always that one guy that comes back to the ramp. I found a big one on a bed, and it's like the water's probably at back home last year there was one we found. The water was like 46 degrees. <laughs> that fish lives shallow her whole life. Yeah. Thing is, yeah. When you find those fish that are literally first on beds, they don't live out deep. They're not gonna come from all the way out in the main lake and swim right. all the way back. And big so fish we're are catching lazy. them fish on their way up to beds. And big fish are lazy. They are lazy. They are real lazy. So if they've got what they need in an area, they're not gonna bail. And the thing too with this bait, you want something on the back of it. You don't want that bait that just moves like this. I want something that kicks as hard as it can because I want to make that bait move without physically moving. And I know that's your thing. I just had to use it again. But it's true. He it mentioned works. that earlier. We was, he's riding up, he rode up here with me and Chuck Nutt. He said, he said that saying. I said, well, he, you, you can't.
can't be stealing my he stuff now. He just used it first. <laughs> I've used it. He just said it, you know, on there first. But, just saying. But it's yeah. a big fish deal, though. Movement it without is. movement. We talk about a jig a lot and having movement without movement. And uh, you know, even when you're slow crawling a jig, the way that I've traditionally done it in the winter time, the thing about a jig is it's always doing something. Even yep. when it's just doing, when that jig's doing this, yep, and it's not even moving, that is doing this. It's always moving. Movement without movement is the big deal for yep. big fish, whether it's a, a big swim bait, a hollow body frog, all these yep. big fish techniques that we think of, catch these big fish, they all have this thing in common. Movement without movement. And literally, the first time that I had even, I think I said that to some guys that I, they was either with me in my boat or something, and they looked at me and they was like, huh? I was like, movement without the movement. They was like, what are you talking about? I said, you want the bait to move without doing this. Mm -hmm. I seen those guys the next week. They said I caught the biggest fish in my life. Which they, it was probably like a, I think it, they said it weighed like right over nine. He said I was fishing with the exact same frog as you, making it move without making it move that way. That's it. That's the thing. That's the same thing with this. Yes. They don't want to bite if it's cold. They don't want to bite. Hit the fish on the head and she'll bite. And force them to react. Force them to bite. Force them into the decision. You know it I is the easiest way to catch fish when it's cold. Yeah. I guarantee you, right now, you could go out here on this lake and do the same thing, and you would whack them. We fit a top three jig rods tomorrow. We're going to work, We're going to know We're going to work, Jack. He's being a rod. You got a rod? With this technique, do not, I can't stress to you enough, I've seen people do it, do not use a medium heavy with a jig. Just, <laughs> it ticks me off when I see it. Don't do it. Use a heavy seven five or bigger this is a seven seven use big line and a fast drill this is a seven five to one i use an eight three to one when they bite it get them in the boat like i said it's cold you're not going to catch 20 fish a day the ones you catch get them in the boat i've seen guys miss more big fish because they're using a short light action rod it ticks me off i end up giving them a rod because i do not want you losing a big fish while you're with me in my boat <laughs> that makes me mad so just use a big rod for this and when they hit it it's not that it's so when y'all book a trip with john you better bring your a game just yeah. tell you. Just tell you, do not miss them when you're with me in my boat <laughs> you think about you. it this is not a light bite it's not that bite where you got that jig ears crawled and it's like is that a fish mm. when they hit it they're going to hit it hard and they will be going that direction with it what? hit them with all you got Hit them. Do not lay back on them. Reel up, get that line tight, and hit them as hard as you can. But last year, I did this even. When it was cold, I missed two fish because I was like, I don't think it's a fish. Hook sets are free. Set the hook. If he ain't there, then he just ain't there. Especially if you're jerking it that violently and putting all that slack in your line. There's going to be times even when yeah. they knock the fire out of it, you might not feel it because you're yeah. putting so much slack in your line with that action. One thing, though, is you will miss some. Because you're doing this, and when it falls, that's when they'll hit it, and you don't know it. Yes, sir. How are you trimming up your jig during wintertime? Don't trim it. For this technique, he's leaving Run the off. full length it's like, To me, what this reminds me, it's like stroking a jig out deep in the summertime, which, you know, everybody job. in East Texas is all, you know, we probably, most of us that have fished a long time in East Texas have heard of stroking a jig out deep. We get out there in the summertime, we put that jig on the bottom, we rip it off the bottom. Yep. Pop, pop. This is a similar type deal. You're just doing it in shallower water. Um, and for that action, when you want to do all this, you want as much flare and flow as yep. you can get. And use a jig that is super heavy. I like to use, mine is like an ounce. Use a one ounce jig to do it. it. Like I said, it sounds weird, but it works. I'm fishing water probably six foot or less. I've been doing that now for that, probably five years. That's now. nothing strange around here. Like we. You know, we've talked about that in the past. Back home, that's strange. Here, that's not that strange. Here, there's not that strange. Like, we've talked about catching shallow fish in, in a, you know, throughout the wintertime. Yeah. Th there are big fish. Here's the deal. It's a little different for him. Not necessarily the case for him. They have a little bit more of a colder water period than we have. But to me, in my opinion, when you get to January 1st, you are now in pre-spawn. Here. And the reason I say that is, I want you to think about something. Who's heard of Valentine's Day spawning bass around here? Every year. Every year around here we have fish. The first wave of fish is on beds around Valentine's Day, sometimes a little sooner, sometimes a little later. Somewhere around early to mid-February we start getting our first 
bass on beds. And what does everybody always say? Man, some of the biggest fish of the year spawn first. Uh, and that's the case. Who, well, who caught Valentine's? Uh, Larry Barnes. Yeah. Larry Barnes on Valentine's Day yeah. on a jig, and I know right where he caught it, and it ain't very deep. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it was like go. the top, it was one of the top five fish ever caught in the state of Texas. Yeah, giant. Um, but if you think about that, if fish are getting on beds the first couple weeks of February, pre spawn for them starts around Christmas. You know, when they're going to start staging up in the staging areas, shallower, you know, on, on shallow break lines and, you know, little creek channels and edges going back into these creeks, the shallow ones. Now, I'm not talking about the 20-foot deep creek channel bends. I'm talking about the 5-foot deep bends with the 1- to 2-foot flats on the outside of it. They're going to start staging in those areas around Christmas if they're going to spawn in February. Because those fish that stage in there in February, when everybody thinks about it, don't spawn until April. So if that happens, it's got to go backwards too. You know what I'm saying? So uh, really when we start getting towards the turn of the new year, I think of it as being the first edge of pre-spawn. And yeah, I'm still looking for the winter home fish that are resident fish in the winter that are out there on the, you know, the bridges or the deep creek bends and all that road beds. We're still catching those that we can of those. But one thing about fishing and tournament fishing, you'll know this. If you can be in front of them, so to speak, if you can kind of be the first one, like, uh, I talked about this with the guy I fished with this morning. <coughs> if you have something to yourself, or you have lesser people fishing something that you're fishing, so let's just say in a tournament environment, if you're the only one fishing four foot of water in January in a tournament, and you can catch 80% of those shallow fish because you're the only one fishing for them, but those guys that are fishing the traditional methods can only catch 10% of those deep fish, who's going to win that tournament? Because they can only get 10% of those fish because there's other guys fishing for them. Uh, they get more pressure on them. They're harder to catch this and that and the other. But if you got something yourself and you can catch 80% of those fish, well, you're going to win that tournament. You know, most tournaments are caught by the guy that's catching the most fish within reason. Yeah. You know. Now, though, basically, like, don't expect to go out on a lake with this stuff and catch them literally the whole day. I don't go out on a, I've literally, I'm gonna say that I've done this now for probably five, six years. I don't wanna catch 30 fish a day. I don't want to. If you are with me in my boat, we probably catch five to six fish a day, but they're all big. You are probably gonna go out and at first with this bait and maybe catch four fish, but they're gonna be five pounds and bigger. For some reason, the smallest fish ever that has actually eat this bait like that, that I personally caught on was this light, technique. on this technique, was like around four pounds. Because the big ones spawn first, they're up there first, while everybody else is all out deep. So just, the way that you do this, you're going to catch the biggest fish of the year in one day. But you're not going to catch them all day long. Alright, let's dig in on the setup a little bit here. So what we've got for a jig, is we've got a three quarter ounce, uh, or, to, or a one ounce. But this is a three-quarter ounce right here, hybrid, six cents divine hybrid jig. Uh, to me, you guys that have heard me talk about jigs know that I believe this is the best combination. Uh, it's a big old head. It's heavy like a football jig. It, it's got a rounded enough bottom. If you wanted to drag it, it acts like a football jig. Yet this head design is the best combination of weedless and hooking fish properly in the right part of the mouth of any jig I've ever used. And I've gone in depth on the head design before. Um, if you'd like to hear why this head, what what is important with head designs, let me know. We get into that in a minute. But three quarter ounce hybrid jig, uh, a swimming type of crawl. This right here is the brand new stroker crawl from Six Sense Fishing. I think they have done which Six Sense does this a lot. When they, if you fix fish their baits, you know when they come out with something, it's they get it right 99.9% .9 of the time, right out of the box. And they have absolutely, to me, probably created the best jig trailer I've ever used in this stroker crawl bait. It's brand new. Just got released. I think they're already sold out of their first run. But uh, the deal with this bait is it combines everything that I want in a jig trailer. It has thin appendages so that when I want to move it slow and crawl it, those thin appendages take less water pressure to move them so I can get that little subtle action out of those thin appendages. But yet when you move it faster, these little tails on here curl up like this right here and creates a kicking 
swimming motion. It kicks back and forth swimming motion. So it does the best of both worlds. It'll fold up like a crawl and sit there and undulate, or it'll kick like a flapping crawl yep. when it moves faster. Uh, so this is a good bait. But mainly, I'm not telling you this is the one you got to have for this technique. I would think that <coughs> any type of a flapping crawl would probably work, whether yep. it be a rage crawl or a chigger crawl. Anything where the, the legs will flap when you swim it fast will work on this. And uh, you're going to leave it full for this technique. Yep, the whole thing. So we're not going to trim it up like I've been teaching for my creek channel bend by it. When we're crawling it, we're trimming everything real short. Totally different deal. Totally different presentation. So rig up on there nice and straight. Feed it up on the keeper. The main thing is you want to measure, you want the, right where your hook bend starts, uh, you want to be able to fit the top of the bait up to the head of the jig and have the hook bend come out, which I did this one just a little bit short, but you want the where the hook bend starts to come out of the back, right where the hook bend starts, while it's snug up to the top of the jig. But that's going to be kind of what it looks like right there. And we'll pass that's that it. around. I'll let y'all get it. Yeah, that you like, uh, you like brown color jigs? Yes. For this deal, you like brown and orange? Brown is my main color. If they won't bite just the brown, I'll throw maybe chartreuse in there sometimes. But I've caught them really on it all. I don't think you have to have just like brown, green, orange, because they're not wanting to eat it anyway. So I think that you could actually use basically whatever. I yeah. just like browns and oranges. That's just what that I like. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we've done so many of these at this point that a lot of you guys have probably heard just about most of what I have to say on, on most bass fishing techniques if you've been watching most of them because, you know, we've done hundreds of hundreds yeah. of videos on instructionals now and we do these every two weeks for several years now and so sometimes we may be repetitive but one thing that I always say, and you guys have probably heard this before, but color is the least important decision you make when you're yeah. picking a bait. So, you to me, first, the most important thing is depth. Yep, is the main thing. Size profile is second. Yep. Action is third. Get the action right. And color is the last one. Yep. In that order. Depth, size profile, action, color. In that order, that's the order of importance. That's the way I think about it. That's the how I want to get those things right in that order. Yep. And if I get the depth right, you know, a lot of times I can have everything else wrong, but if I get the depth right and keep the bait in the right depth, I'll it get a works. bite. I'll it get a works. bite. And then if I get the depth and the size profile right, even if the action's not wrong, I'll still right. get bites. And boy, if I can get the depth, the size profile, and the action right, we're finna catch them, Jack, regardless of the color. Yep. Regardless of the color. And then at the end, you know, if you want to tweak out on color and refine it, you know, are there days when there are certain colors that matter? Yeah. Yep. For something like this where the bait's moving it, let me ask you something, J-Bo. That's my nickname for him. <laughs> John Bowling. That's on J-Bo right there. Let me ask you something. You ready? Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question. What color is that you Mm. What color is that jig? I don't know. Y'all know what color? Y'all know what color that jig is? And fish don't know either. They can't see it because that's how fast it's going. It's just right. it's going. Sh -sh -sh -sh. His brain's the size of a pea. You really think he's going to say, "I'm not that jig is not the <laughs> one that I'm going to eat because it's not this color with yeah. this amount of orange." They don't give a crap. Yeah. They do not care. Yeah. They just that's eat right. it because it's there. I've always said a bass. It's in their face and it's acting aggressively. That, and here's the thing, bass don't have hands. They can't grab it and feel of it. That's they a, have to put right. it in their mouth. They are curious by nature again. Yes, they're apex predators. They have predators. to put it in their mouth. And when something piques their attention, there's only one way for them to figure out what it is, and that's yep. to get a little nibble of it. Billy? Yes, sir? How long do you let it drop to get their attention? Do you well, let it sit listen, there? Listen, this is a brand new thing to me that I'm just learning with y'all. So, John? All the way down to the bottom. All the way down. Let that thing fall. Five feet of water, just all the way down. For a second. Now this bait, if it has to fall this far, it's gonna do it like that. Yeah. Like it's, it falls quick. You don't have to sit there and be like, okay, it's there. No, it's not there. When it falls, it goes slack and thunk. It's there. Sure. Like that thing falls super, super fast. Now once it's on the bottom, do you let it sit at all, or as soon as it hits the bottom, you Same, stroke it back up? As soon as it hits it, rip it. So like no hesitation, this is. is just up and down, it's a total reaction. What it is, is it's a cast, click, hits the bottom, rip it. If they don't bite it on that first rip, you just reel it in and then go back to so the So you're stump. throwing it up next to a stump, let it hit the bottom, rip it away from that stump, let it fall and then reel it in. Cause, yeah, because here's the thing, if they're anywhere at that stump, this isn't a technique where you have to basically like, okay, that side of the stump, that side of the stump, throw to the stump, if they're at that stump, they will come over there. Yeah. The with it acting all crazy. You know, to me, this reminds me a lot of 
kind of some of the things that we do with a glide bait, ironically, which is a bait that we fish pretty methodically and slowly. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, this reminds me of some of the things that we do with a glide bait where we force, force the fish into a decision. Yep. The fish is either going to get it or he's not. If he's not going to get it, we're going to run him out of there because we're fishing this bait so aggressively. And if he is going to get it, he's going to pounce on it right away. And, you know, on a glide bait, they'll track it and follow it from a distance and get in behind it and watch it. And then we do these little twitches with these glide baits, and everybody talks about how, man, that glide bait will turn around and look at them. Well, it doesn't really have to turn all the way around and look at them, but what a glide bait does is as a fish tracks it, and then you twitch it and give it slack, that glide bait will come out there and go, and it, as they're behind it, then all of a sudden it does this, it gets in their face. Yeah. And they got one or two things they can do. They can open their mouth and eat it. Or they can turn and go. Or they'll, or they'll turn and run because it's acting too aggressive for that fish. And if that fish turns and run, I don't care what you did, you weren't catching him. Nope. And with this jig, if he don't bite it when you stroke it and he turns and runs, you weren't catching that fish. He's not going to bite anyway. So you just do that as many times as possible. Yep. You do it all day. You make a million casts. It, I'm learning. I'm guessing as I yeah. go here. But you tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong. You just make a million casts to a million stumps. Yep. And at the end of the day, you get five to eight, maybe ten bites on a good day. But you go to the you go to the weigh-in with a big sack. This is yeah. the thing. Cover as much water in a day as you can. Fish fast, hit as many stumps as you can in a creek, and fish them fast. Do not make more than one cast at a stump. Do not sit here at a stump and cast and cast, cast at it. Cast at it once, if you don't get bit, there's not one there. Make as many casts to as much wood in a day as you can, and you will get bit. Very cool. That's a very cool, very cool technique. Other than that, though, that's and about it. it. It's right <laughs> in my wood, boy. That's right in my You got me all kinds of excited because that fits. <laughs> The way I like to fish so, so well. Uh, is there any questions on anything so far? You got a shot car charged up. That's the trick. <laughs> yeah. Better make sure it's charged up. Have them batteries charged all the way. So the wood itself, I mean, you're talking about vertical, any kind of wood lay down. I mean, if you can see it. Mainly stumps that stand up. They vertical. won't be on the banks, those that lay down. They will not be up in that. Okay. Cause, and, but you want to... This works better on the days with sun because they will literally, if the stump's here, that fish will set on that stump. But fish the stumps and cover as many in a day as you can. Okay. If there's a lay down in the right depth, is that, a, is that something you'll they throw at? They will it? not be on it. That's not really the I've deal. did it and tried it. They won't be on it. It's a good way to hang a lot of jigs up, set the hook on them yeah. when you're ripping in that lay down too. That's happened too. That's another reason that I don't do it. There you go. So when do you start this technique? I mean, now. I mean now. When the water gets below 61 to 62 degrees, start it. Run That's it fun. until the water gets up to about 60 or so. Run it. Well, I'm going to tell you, when that water gets up there after the 50s, I'm going to be back there with my chatter bait. But <laughs> you'll probably beat me for a few days, but I'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> See, and, I, and I like your chatter bait and asking you a question now with the whole lake uh, being as low as it's gone I don't understand you know even though we've got a lot of water they're either letting a lot of it out yeah so typically in October November and years past and I don't know I haven't looked at the reports but in, in several years past uh, they have sucked water uh, to Dallas in October, November from Fork. It's almost like they've got the lakes on a rotation, and October, November is Fork's month. And so I think that's why, even though we've had some rain, the lakes continue to drop. Hopefully, now that it's December, that'll kind of settle in where it is. And then now, every time we get a. We also we have had rain, but we haven't had like a really good flow and soak and rain in a while. And we did go into drought at the end of summer. So, that, you know, a few different, as always. Like when the grass died in 2010, 11, we had that drought and everything, everybody was like, they're spraying the grass. They, no, they are spraying grass now, but let, that's a hope. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get it started. Time that's out. A, Time out. We got a whole another episode. Reset, because this will be a long seminar, <laughs> and I'll probably get fired. I don't know if you can get fired from being a guide, but I'm about to. Um, back in 2011, when the water dropped, out, everybody thought the grass died. It was just several different things that happened. So we had grass growing out to around eight, nine, ten foot on fork, which is wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, then the water got all the way down to seven and three quarters foot low, an all-time record low. So now all the grass we had was in one to two foot of water tops. That was all the grass we had in the lake. That winter, we had three days where the high never got above freezing for three days. Well, if you know anything about grass in the wintertime, the really shallow grass, when it gets super cold, the shallow grass will die. The deep grass will survive, then as waters warm up, that deep grass will expand into the shallows again. So, 
So when the water, huh? When you say deep, you're talking what six to? Eight yeah, feet? you know, typically around here, with the water temps we get, as long as it's as it's in four to five to six foot of water, it'll survive the cold in the winter time around here. But we only had it in one to two foot of water at that time. And then we got three days in a row below freezing, which is freakish for around here. And it killed every stitch of grass in the lake. And then the lake was low for a few years and there was no grass. And people were like, man, there's no, they killed all the grass. No, they didn't. Mother Nature killed that grass and it took it a while to come back, you know. And, and so this is kind of a similar situation. The reason the lake's staying low is not because of one thing or another. We haven't had the flowing running rains. We did have a drought at the end of summer where all the lakes around here dropped. Uh, and then I do think that they tend to, I don't know if they did this year or not, but it seems like in years past they always suck water to Dallas in October, November. So several things just like before. Sure. And it'll come back up. You know, we'll get those rains sometime over the winter, especially when we get to February, March. It, it, it should. As long as we don't get down to four, five, six feet low for some reason this winter, which we shouldn't, uh, it, it'll jump right back up to full pool during the spawn, and we'll have a healthy spawn again. Everything will be beautiful. So. Uh, if you were asking, now did you want to ask, Am I fishing the chatterbait a lot right now with the lake being low? Is that what you're... Well, in the grass, in the, in the yeah. lower four to five feet. There's, there's, very, uh, there's very limited areas that have the grass where you want to fish the chatterbait right now. Right now. What I will tell you is as we turn the corner at New Year's and we get into that pre-spawn mode, every time we get a warming trend for two or three days, it won't matter if the grass is there. I will say also this. I will throw more crankbaits than I will chatterbaits with no grass. I'll throw more square bills, movement ADX, shallow diving crankbaits, deflecting off the cover. Because the deal is, anytime, even on the warming trend, the water's still in the 50s. Yeah. You know, it's still cold. The fish are, they're, they're feeling good. They're moving up shallow, but they're still a little lethargic. So I want something that makes them react. And when there's grass up there, okay, the lipless crankbait and the chatterbait contact the grass, snap it out. That's your reaction bite, right? So with no grass to rip the chatterbait out of or the lipless crankbait out of, I'll go to a square bill or the movement ADX shallow diving crankbaits that will deflect off hard cover really well and I'll let that deflection cause my reaction bites for those fish and they will get dirt shallow on the warming trend in January, grass or no grass. So that still will happen, you just may have to attack them a little bit.